when the storms of life are raging, awaiting can be the greatest struggle. You can feel trapped in darkness, cold and alone. Lost, wandering, desperate for a sign. Thirsting for solace and finding none. Stranded and surrounded by the rising waters around us. Endlessly running but never seeming to reach your goal. Fighting the temptation to simply give up. And in these moments when hope seems lost, listen, for I am calling out. Hold on. I have not forgotten you. Hold on. You are precious to me. Listen, hold on. My rescue draws near. For I will lift you out of the darkness. And in the midst of suffering and storms, reach out your hand to mine. And hold on. At the feet of Jesus, we have to hold on. Anybody here ever had a bad day? I figured that was a pretty universal concept. We've all been there before, right? Well, I love to read to my kids. I love to spend some time with them and read in, uh, right before bed a lot of times. And uh, in particular, Stephen, who is our youngest, he's, our, he's the runt of the litter. And uh, he, he is the one that loves to pick out books and come and sit in, in my lap. And even in the nursery uh, during, during Sunday school, I was sitting with him in the rocking chair, and he gets into his spot, friends. I mean, he's got a spot. He sits on this side, right, in his little niche right here in the crooks of my arm. And, uh, and we love to read and did that even this morning. But this is such a good little book. Anybody ever read Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day? What a fantastic, I mean, this book is probably, I don't know, 60, 70 years old, and uh, it is uh, fantastic. I want to just start and just see if you can identify with Alexander at all. Here's the opening picture there, Alexander standing in his room and uh, just standing there with his arms crossed, just looking about as down in the dumps as possible. Here's what it says. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth, and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard, and by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running, and I could tell that it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Anybody ever been there? You've had those, I mean, I need an amen. Y'all need to wake up. Somebody give me an amen. We've been through this. We've had some very bad days. Uh, How many of you would say not only have you had a bad day, but maybe you've had a bad season, a bad week, a bad month maybe, maybe even a bad year? How about a bad decade? We've been there, right? We know what this is like. And so the question then becomes, what do we do when life turns up trouble? You know, what I love about where we're going to be going over the next several months is we're going to be looking at the book of James. I love the book of James. It is incredibly practical. It is where the boots hit the ground of what it means to live out our faith every single day. It's the practical application of the things that we say that we believe. It is faith that works. And friends, this is going to open with what we do when life throws us curveballs. When trouble arises, how do we hold on? What do we do? What does Scripture intend for us? James's theme is genuine faith applied to life. And maybe you've wondered about that. How does this really apply to my everyday life? Because some of us are so guilty, right, of kind of turning our faith in our lives into TV dinners, 
Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? The TV dinner, it's got kind of everything. has got its own little place. Some of y'all are like that at Thanksgiving. They have special plates for you people, right, that have just everything has its little box, right? That's not me. I want gravy over the whole lot. Just put it all on the same. It's all going to the same place. That's my motto, right? But so many times in our lives, we can treat our lives like a TV dinner. And so we have, you know, our work in this corner, maybe our school, our friendships, and, you know, our, our extracurricular activities. And then over here, there's a little, a little pouch, a little section that's for our faith. And friends, what I want you to understand is that what James is going to teach us and what Jesus had in mind for all of us is that our faith would impact everything. It would permeate every other aspect of our lives. And so what does this look like? So I want to ask if you would to open up your Bibles to this book of James. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there's a, a Pewback Bible right there in front of you and on page 1199. I'm going to take the guesswork out of it for you. Page 1199, you will find uh, this first chapter of this incredible book. And when I talk about just how practical this book is, what I want you to know is that there are 59 practical commands in just 108 verses. And this book is only 108 verses, and half of those are just practical commands. Just how do we do this? How do we live this life of faith that God has called us to? What an incredible thing for us to remember. And what I also want you to know, something very special about this book of James, written by the half-brother of Jesus, a nickname James the Just. But something that I would like for you to know about this is this was the very first New Testament book ever to be written. And you know how it opens? Count it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. Isn't it interesting that the very first book ever written in the New Testament, now not the first one that we come to, but the very first one ever written in the life of the church that Jesus had founded, opens with us to remember that we should count our struggles and our trials as joy. Whew. If you're not ready, I really hope that you brought your steel-toed boots this morning because we're all going to need them as we encounter this book. Would you all stand with me? And we're going to read through the first 12 verses of, of this incredible book. James chapter 1, starting in verse number 1. I'm going to read this out loud. You follow along there in your Bible or on the screen. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Heavenly Father, our prayer is that these words might come alive to us today, because as we have already seen, all of us know what it's like to have a bad day. We all know what it's like to struggle through the trials and the tribulations that this life has to offer. Lord, they surround us, and we fall into various struggles. So God, what do we do? Lord, as we look at your word would we be convicted where we need conviction? Would you encourage us where we need encouragement? 
Lord, would you help us today to have joy and contentment and peace regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the situations that we encounter. Lord, would you be glorified even in the storms? Would we learn to praise you in the storm today? We love you and we thank you for this time to gather and to worship and to dig into your word. Would you change us, transform us into the image of your son and our savior? Change us from the inside out today because we have come in contact with you, our great and glorious Father. We lift these things up in the name of Jesus Christ, and everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, listen, this is a typical New Testament letter, and this morning, I want you, I want to encourage you, if you would, inside of your bulletin, uh, there's a little note sheet that you can kind of follow along with some things that we're going to be looking at, but the sermon today, just a reminder to you that there's purpose in the pain. There's purpose in the pain that you are going through in your life. God has a plan. He has a purpose. Probably one of the most overused statements in Christendom, probably in evangelical Christianity, Romans 8, 28, right? That God is working all things together for the good of those who love him or are called according to his purposes. Now listen, when you're going through a tough time, that's a hard verse to believe, isn't it? I mean, let's be honest, it's hard to believe that God has a purpose in the pain. But what James is going to show, what he's going to demonstrate for us this morning, is that very fact that God indeed has a purpose in the pain for your good, for his glory. But as he begins this letter, he begins like all of the other New Testament epistles, all of the other New Testament letters. It starts with the author and who the intended recipient is and the authority that this author is writing with and then extends them greetings. And this is probably the simplest of them. It just says James. Now, there's a few Jameses in Scripture, and so it's important for us to kind of identify, but there's only one, according to most every scholar, that this could possibly be, nicknamed James the Just, James the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 6, verse number 3, actually talks about the family members of Jesus. I don't know how many of you know that Jesus had brothers and sisters, but Mark chapter 6, verse number 3, the people are asking in Jesus' hometown, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of What's the name? James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. See, these people knew Jesus' family. James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, who would later be known as Jude because he didn't want to have the name of the betrayer of Jesus. So he changed his name to Jude, and that's what he was known by. And we have a book of the Bible with that same name, Jude. There are two books of the New Testament written by the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. It's an incredible thing for us to consider. But friends, here's what I want you to know. James did not believe in Jesus when Jesus was doing ministry on this earth. And when I said that to Brittany, when we were talking about this, she was kind of dumbfounded. She was shocked to hear that Jesus' own family did not believe in Jesus. In fact, John chapter 7, verse number 5, said that they mocked Jesus, and they did not believe in him. But here's what I want you to know. When Jesus rose from the dead, every other preconceived notion up to that point got thrown out of the window for James and for Jude, and for Simon, and for Joseph, and for Mary, and for his sisters. Because all of a sudden, everything that Jesus had ever taught, everything that he had ever done, all of the miracles, every teaching, it was all confirmed. Because listen, friends, when somebody rises from the dead, we need to believe what they say. I mean, let's just be honest, right? Every other god of every other religion on the face of this planet died and was buried and stayed dead except for one, and his name is Jesus. 
And Jesus rose from the grave, and when he rose from the grave, he didn't just appear to hundreds of people, which he did. He appeared specifically to a few people, and one of those people, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 7, was James. The, the oldest of his brothers, and he appeared to James, as if to say, I know that this is hard to believe, brother, but it's all true. I wonder what that conversation would have been like, don't you? But here's what I do know. A few years later, when James was writing this book, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word servant, in common vernacular, what we would really understand is slave, you know, I don't know about you, if you had younger siblings or older siblings, did they ever make you be their slave? Did, did they ever have something over on you, something that they knew that you did, and you were like, I'm going to tell mom, I'm going to tell dad, unless you do all my chores for me and anything I ask you to do. Did that ever happen to anybody, or is that just in the movies, right? James believed in his heart that Jesus was the Lord of all, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus didn't have to hold anything over on James. James willingly admitted, I am a slave of God and of my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ. James's brother was his king, was his Savior. What an incredible thing for us to understand as we're going through and he became a pillar of the church at Jerusalem, one of the primary leaders there. And he writes this letter, he says, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. He's talking about Jewish believers who now have had to leave Rome because of such intense persecution of the early church. And they scatter all over the place. But here's what I want you to know. That word dispersion it is the word sowing like a farmer that sows seeds. And what I want you to know is that even from the very beginning, what James is painting a picture of for his audience, for these Jewish believers, is that though they have scattered to the ends of the empire, seeking refuge from intense persecution and trouble and trial and tribulation, what he wants them to know is that it was a sowing. It was intentional. God had a purpose and a plan even in their pain. And he has a purpose and a plan for your pain too. And he continues on with some teachings that we need to understand. Teachings on trouble, that there is purpose in the pain. Number one, our attitude in trouble. He's teaching us about our attitude in trouble. Verse number two, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Friends, so many times when we look at a verse like this, or maybe you've encountered this before, and you think, how am I supposed to feel joy in the midst of trouble? And what I want you to understand is James is not talking about how you should feel. He's talking about what you should think. Let me say that one more time. James is not addressing how you should feel in the midst of trial. He is talking about what you should think about your trials, about your tribulations. And what is it that he wants you to think? You guys remember when, uh, when Dr. Paul Chipman was here and he presented to us the idea of think right live right, that so much of what we do and how we behave is born out of our minds, right? We've got to love the Lord with all of our minds, and we've got to submit every thought and take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ, and we've got to think right to live right. And he wants us to understand that what he's asking us to do is an unnatural reaction to pain. And so we've got to be intentional, about counting it all joy when we meet trials. There's a commentator, his name is Ronald Blue, and this is what he says. All too often, trials prompt groanings and complaints. And this kind of response does not contribute to Christian maturity. It only makes matters worse. 
Trials are not to be seen as tribulations, but testings. A test is given to see if a student can pass, not pass out. I've, I've had some tests in my academic career that I thought I was going to pass out from. I've had some tests in this life that I thought that I might pass out from. But what I want you to understand is that when we encounter trials and testings, it is to test the genuineness, the authenticity of our faith. It's in the testing that you find out who you really are, what you're really made of. You ever been in a relationship with someone early on, maybe maybe it was with your spouse, maybe it was a boyfriend or girlfriend, and you went through a really difficult season with that person, a difficult trial, a tribulation of some kind, and you found out who they really were, be it good or bad, but you find out who they really were? That's what we're talking about here. This is what James is trying to get us to understand, that we need to have an attitude of sheer, unadulterated joy. Joy being defined as a contentment, a peace that transcends our circumstances, a peace and a contentment in who Jesus is, not what we're going through. A a willingness to just hold on to the promises of God, even in the darkest storm, even in the toughest season of life that we might go through. And I've been reading um, in in my daily readings uh, through Job. And I love this book, but I got to tell you, it's tough. It's tough to read Job because it's raw and it's real. And Job is going through just a terrible time. Listen, at the end of Job chapter 1, All of these servants kind of come before Job, and they're bringing him bad news. You think you've had a bad day? Let me tell you about Job's bad day. One servant comes to Job and says, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone am left. And while he is telling this to Job, another servant comes and tells him, that the fire of God had fallen and burned up his sheep and his servants that were out in the field. And then while he was speaking, another servant came that same day, that same moment, and said, by the way, Job, the Chaldeans formed groups and they made a raid on your camels and your servants, and I alone have lived to tell the tale. And while that servant was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. In a matter of minutes, on what arguably, and there shouldn't be much argument, is the worst day of Job's life. He finds out that all of his livestock and the significant majority of his servants and his children and his homes are all destroyed, all gone. You think you've had a bad day? Put yourself in Job's shoes for just a moment. Imagine how you would feel in that moment. What would you do? Let me tell you what Job did. Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground. And the very next word, and what did he do? He worshiped. And he worshiped. And he said, naked I come from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but this is the picture of sheer, unadulterated, whole joy in the life of someone who has had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. He worships. And friends, we've got to remember to worship. We've got to remember to worship, to love God. Enough that even in the midst of struggles to, like Job, say, though you slay me, yet I will praise your name. Though you slay me, yet I will worship you. That, my friends, is joy. That is contentment in the promises of God. But friends, I also want to just make mention of one other quick thing here. 
James doesn't say if you meet trials. He says when you meet trials. See, trials are inevitable. When you meet trials of various kinds. Listen, there's there so many different ways that you and I can fall into trial and tribulation and struggle. You know it. I know it. We've all experienced this. The, the truth is, like Jerry Falwell used to say when I was going to Liberty, you're either in a storm right now, you've just gotten out of a storm, or you're just getting ready to go into a storm. But all of us have this shared experience of being in the storms of life. The storms of life are inevitable. And so James doesn't say if, he says when you encounter these troubles. There's a, a poet. Her name is Amy Carmichael. She was a longtime missionary in South India, and she was no stranger to hardships in her missions endeavors. But as a Christian, she knew that she would suffer for the sake of the Lord. Friends, I think it's important for us to remember, even as Western Americanized Christians, that sometimes we think and we believe in some kind of prosperity gospel, that if we believe and put our faith in Jesus, that, we'll, that everything will be peaches and cream from then on out. And that is as far from the New Testament teaching of what it means to follow Jesus as you can get. Amy wrote this in a poem. She said, Hast thou no scar? No hidden scar on foot or side or hand. I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archers, spent, leaned me against the tree to die, and rent by ravening beasts that encompassed me, I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound? No scar? Yes, as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound nor scar? Listen, if you're going to follow Jesus, guess what? You're going to have scars. You're going to be wounded for the cause of Christ. You're going to encounter trials of various kinds. Expect it. It's inevitable. Well, what do you do in it, have joy. Have joy. And friends, there's an advantage to trouble. Not only our attitude in trouble, but the advantage of trouble. We've got to be able to look beyond. And the advantage of trouble is this. What it results in us is our own maturity, our own completion. What he says is this. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Any, uh, any folks in here would be willing to admit that they are stubborn people. All right, so we got a few stubborn folks. I am one of those, but I have a, a word that I prefer over stubbornness, okay? And maybe it's just me, but I prefer the word tenacious. Right, it's got a positive spin. When somebody says stubborn, I think, well, that's negative. I don't want to be thought of as negative. I want to be thought of as tenacious, right? Just a, a stick to itness that I'm just willing to press through adversity. That's what this is. That's this word, steadfastness. And friends, when we go through trials, God grants us tenacity for the trials that we will encounter later. The more trials, the more struggles, the more tribulations, the more tenacity that you will develop. And let that tenacity, that steadfastness, have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. Nobody, nobody wants to go through the trials. We desire comfort. But friends, what we need to understand is that in the trials, in the struggles, in the tribulations that we grow, that we become dependent on the Lord, that we experience that kind of maturity. Hold on. Moses held on for 80 years. Abraham held on for 25. Joseph held on for 13. Many of those in a prison cell. We've got to hold on. We've got to weather the storm. We've got to develop tenacity. And we've got to cooperate with the process. It uses this word, and let steadfastness. Listen, that, friends, that's a, that's a word of cooperation. We've got to allow the struggles, allow the trials to work in us to our own maturity. Jesus, in Hebrews 
chapter 12, verse number 2 says this, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy set before him in the cross. Friends, when you look at the cross, I don't know about you, but it's hard to see the joy that it would have been to experience the excruciating pain of crucifixion. But when Jesus looked at it, he saw the, the joy that would come from knowing that beyond the pain, beyond the shame, beyond everything that he would go through, he would sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. There was a glory that he could look forward to beyond his situation beyond the circumstances. And friends, there is a wholeness in Christ when we lack nothing despite our circumstances. We can, too, look to the joy that was set before us. And so not only our attitude in troubles, but the advantage of troubles and God's assistance with trouble. Friends, we've got to pray. Very simply put, we've, we've got to be willing to pray if any of you lacks wisdom. Wisdom being the, the practical application of our faith. If any of you lacks this kind of wisdom, the wisdom to be able to weather the storm, the wisdom to be able to hold on to your faith despite your circumstances, let him ask God who gives generous, generously to all without reproach and it will be given him, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. Friends, I think sometimes we can come to this right here and we can think, I, I don't know how to not be a doubter in the midst of the storms. I mean, Jesus' own disciples were doubters. Jesus was going to heal a, a man's son who was demon-possessed, and the man said, if you can, would you deliver my son? Would you heal him? And Jesus says, if I can, if I can, if you just have faith, it will be done. And the man says these words that I would encourage you to hold on to throughout every struggle that you ever have. So many times we doubt ourselves. We doubt our circumstances. We doubt our friends. We doubt our families. But friends, you never have to doubt Jesus. That man looked to Jesus and he says, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Would you just honestly pray to God in the midst of the storm? Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. When Peter was walking on the water and he began to doubt because he looked at his circumstances, it wasn't Jesus that he doubted, friends. I, mean, I want you to think about that for a moment. Peter doubted himself. He doubted his ability to walk on the water. But he didn't doubt Jesus. He could see Jesus, and Jesus was safe and sound. And in your circumstances, be careful. The doubts will arise in you for your circumstances. They will, they will arise in you about your own abilities. But don't ever let those doubts cloud the faithfulness and the strength and the ability of Almighty God whatever you're going through. Look to Jesus. He is more than able, always. Always. No matter what he's called you to, no matter what difficulty you go through, God's assistance is there. He is empowering you by prayer. James had another nickname. His nickname was this, Camel Knees. Camel knees, that was his nickname in the New Testament. And you know why? Because he developed calluses on his knees for being a man of prayer. Oh my God, that we would become people with a reputation of being camel need. That we would be a praying church, a praying people that devoted ourselves to seeking the Lord and seeking his empowerment to do what he has called us to do. Let us not be double-minded you want to know what a double-minded person is? Simply put, although he claims to be a believer, his action reveals he is an unbeliever. 
When he goes through a severe trial, he turns to human resources rather than singularly trusting the Lord for answers and for help. Or he becomes bitter and resentful and seeks no help at all. He doesn't renounce God, but he acts as if God doesn't exist, doesn't care, or isn't capable of delivering him from trouble. He knows something of God's word and of God's love, grace, and providence, but he refuses to avail himself of those divine resources. See, that double-minded man isn't somebody who outright seems to doubt the abilities of God. That double-minded man is a person who doesn't even seek the resources that God provides. Acts as an unbeliever pretending that God isn't even there or doesn't care. And I think John MacArthur in that way is spot on. I do. And friends, there's another piece of this that I think is is important for us when we're talking about this kind of faith that's unwavering without doubting. It's the faith and the hope and the character of our God. That he's the great promise keeper no matter what we're going through. Because listen, friends, trials and tribulations serve as great equalizers. James goes into a discussion about the rich and the poor, which is an important thing for us to remember. But listen, what he says is that unlike Frank Sinatra and uh, Marlon Forbes, who apparently coined this phrase, he who dies with the most toys wins, it's as if to say, listen, I don't know if you know this or not, but trials and tribulations in our life go to prove that he who dies with the most toys dies anyway. He who dies with the most toys still dies, friends. And he goes on to say, listen, the rich man in his pursuit of all of his wealth is going to fade just like the flowers of the grass. That that beauty is going to perish. And so what does he explain? Listen, in your trials, in your tribulations, the poor need to boast in their future destiny and their identity in Christ. Who are they? And the rich need to boast in the fact that they are associated with the lowliness of Christ. When they go through trials and struggles, they identify with what Jesus went through. And so the poor boast in their exaltation in who they are in Jesus Christ, that they are loved, that they are cherished, that they are children of the one true King of kings and Lord of lords, and they can boast in that. And when the rich, so that they don't, become prideful and arrogant because of what they have. Listen, friends, this is, this is a lesson for all of us. There was no middle class in the New Testament age. There were poor people and there were rich people. There were no kind of middle folks. According to the rest of the world, you and I are incredibly wealthy. Whether you live paycheck to paycheck, friends, most of the world lives on less than a dollar a day. Most of the world, we are wealthy. And so, friends, it's important for us not to exalt in our wealth, not to become prideful and arrogant in what resources we have at hand, but for us to associate ourselves with the lowliness of Christ, to humble ourselves like him, to be willing to serve, to be willing to give our lives as a ransom for many the way that James did when he would become a martyr later on in his life. And the last thing I want us to look at today, the very last thing, not just our attitude in trouble and the advantage of trouble and God's assistance with trouble through prayer as we seek his face, but the award for surviving trouble. Verse number 12 says this, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, who remains tenacious, right? Who has that stubbornness, this innate quality that is born because of struggles, For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And friends, so many commentators want to take a look at that, and they're like, oh yes, he's making an allusion to the the Greek games, the Olympic games crown, this wreath that they would put on their head as the victor. And friends, that's a great image, but I don't think that's where he's going with this. Because the Greek language here in the book of James is the crown that is life. The crowning glory of you and I as followers of Jesus is not some crown with jewels in it. The crowning glory of our following Jesus is the glory of heaven with him. 
Life forever. Aren't you glad, friends, that this is not the end? That no matter what you're struggling through, even if you don't survive it, even if you got a terrible diagnosis and you fought the good fight every day, doing everything right, and you died anyway, that is not the end. It's not the end for us. The end, the crown, is life itself forevermore. Death is but a gateway ushering us into the presence of our Savior where our faith becomes sight. Amen. Amen. That's the glory of heaven. And friends, that's why Paul could write the way that he did. That's why he could say, blessed is the man. That, that word there is makarios in Greek. It means happy. Happy is the man who knows that the end of his life, the crown is life itself. Life forevermore. Jesus said, I have come to bring you life and to bring it more abundantly. I am the way and the truth and the life. Romans chapter 8, verse number 16 through 18 says this, I am sure what we are suffering now cannot compare with the glory that will be shown to us. I don't know what you're going through right now, but it doesn't even compare to the glory of heaven. And you're like, Pastor John, you don't know what I'm going through. You're right, I don't. But I know this. Whatever your troubles, whatever your circumstances they don't even pale. They don't even compare to what Jesus has in store for you and for me when we go through heaven's doors one day. And again, he says in, in his letter to the church at Corinth, he says that, that our circumstances aren't even worth the eternal weight of glory that is set before us. How many of y'all are looking forward to a day when all of our troubles will be gone, when every tear will be wiped away, when our bodies will no longer be failing but we'll be given a new body? How many of you are looking forward to that? How many of y'all have ever had a bad day? I think we asked that question, didn't we? You had a bad day? Would you look forward to the glory that's to come? Would that be the source of your joy and your contentment and your peace even in the storms where you can say, even in the worst of storms of my life, even through the darkest valley or the way Psalm 23 puts it, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for why? For you are with me. Because of Jesus, we have joy. Because of Jesus, we have contentment. Because of Jesus, we have peace. But there are some of you here today who don't have that peace, don't have that joy, don't have that contentment because you are not yet a follower of Jesus. And friends, I just have one very simple question to ask you. What are you waiting for? Where are you going to put your hope when the days turn dark? Where are you going to derive your peace when you go through a circumstance that drains you completely? Friends, I want you to know something very, very true. God will give you more than you can handle and often does. So many people want to quote and say, God will never give you more than you can handle. Friends, that's a lie. Scripture teaches the exact opposite. God will give us more than we can handle. Why? So that we will turn to Him. So that we will be driven to our knees in desperation to seek the strength that only He can provide. What are you going to do when you reach that moment when you just can't give anymore and you just can't do anymore and your tears have soaked the pillows? And life is just hard. What are you going to do? Turn to Jesus. Go to the feet of Jesus, as Ron sang earlier. At the feet of Jesus. And friends, 
hold on. Hold on. Know that God is faithful always. Lord God, I pray this morning that you will have impacted our hearts in a way like never before, that we would know that we can count it all joy, whole joy, even in the midst of trials and tribulations. God, if there's anyone here who's never made the decision to follow Jesus, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that they would make their way forward as we sing to come and talk to me and say, Pastor John, what do I need to do to be saved? I'm ready. What do I need to do to have the the gift of glory of eternal life? I want that. Maybe there's some folks here that just need to rededicate themselves to the Lord. Maybe there are marriages that need to be restored because it's been dark times and trying struggles. And couples just need to come on their face at this altar and say, we submit to Jesus. Lord, help us to hold on. Help us to look for the joy in Christ. Maybe there are some people here that just need to rededicate themselves. And God, I pray that you would touch their hearts, God, that you would let them know to turn away from the sin in their lives and to pursue Jesus always. God, maybe there are some people here that just want to join with this body of believers and say, we want to be members here. We want to be a part of this work of creating a community of faith that's all about Jesus. God, I don't know what it is that you are doing in the lives of individuals all over this room, but I know that you're moving and I know that you're working because you're working in me because you're moving in me. God, help me to be a Job that though I go through terrible seasons, though it seems like you are slaying me, Lord, yet I will praise your name. Give us that kind of tenacity to weather adversity and to worship you in the midst of the storm. That is our prayer this morning. God, we love you and we thank you and we lift all of these things up in the matchless, powerful name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said...